This Civic Media Podcast is sponsored by UW Organ and Tissue Donation. Organ donations are desperately needed, and now is the right time to become an organ donor. Talk to your family. Get the dot. Save lives. Go to HeroicDeed.com. What is up, Wisconsin and beyond? I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to the Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Got a great show for you all for you all today. I've got a very special friend of mine that's going to be joining us in just a couple of minutes. His name is Bill Whitford. He's been a law professor at the University of Wisconsin for over 35 years. He knows a lot about gerrymandering because he was the named plaintiff in the Wisconsin gerrymandering case that went all the way to the Supreme Court um, and sort of set some precedent but didn't all at the same time. We're going to talk to Bill about that. I can't wait to dig into that conversation. But of course, everyone, some breaking news right before we came on air. It seems to be that that is the state of play these days. And I'm not talking about one of Donald Trump's shocking cabinet appointments. I'm talking about what I think is surprising to very few and yet deeply disappointing. Jack Smith moving to dismiss the charges against Donald Trump in both the election and documents cases, as I like to call them, the insurrection case and the super secret spy documents case. Um, Again, this happened today. He asked a federal judge in Washington to dismiss the indictment charging President-elect Donald J. Trump with plotting to subvert the 2020 election. Um, And he cited the longstanding Justice Department policy uh, against pursuing prosecutions uh, uh, towards a sitting president. Minutes after that filing in Washington, D.C., Jack Smith made a similar filing to an appeals court in Atlanta, ending his attempts to reverse the dismissal of the other federal case against Donald Trump, that being the super secret spy documents case, dismissed on a legal theory that had been rejected by federal courts many times over, but that which Judge Aileen Cannon, a legal scholar by no stretch, (laughs) Um, you all have heard me talk about Aileen Cannon quite a bit. Yes, she dismissed the super secret spy documents case against Mr. Trump, Uh, Jack Smith had been appealing that. He is now abandoning that appeal, which is quite fascinating when it comes to what that means for federal precedent relating to the constitutional arguments that Aileen Cannon was persuaded by that, again, no other federal court, though these arguments have been brought many times, had been persuaded by, in a nutshell, that the special counsel's office itself is unconstitutional. That was certainly, I think, a bit of a shock to most constitutional legal scholars. Uh, But of course, you know, Aileen Cannon going her own way. Uh, Lots there to unpack. I'm going to save that because I wanted to bring on my my special guest. Again, Professor Whitford, Bill, it's it's a real treat to be sitting here with you many, Um, many, many years after you and I uh, used to confab up Bascom Hill, just a few, a mile and a half or so from here. How are you, Professor Whitford? I'm fine, and similarly, a pleasure for me to be here. Yes. So let's just jump right into it. You were the named plaintiff. And to set the stage, back in 2010, we had the decennial census. We've had one subsequently in 2020. We'll have one again in 2030. But after the 2010 census, the Wisconsin government was entirely controlled by Republicans. And so they were able to unilaterally, based on the 2010 census, redraw both state Senate and assembly district lines, as well as congressional lines. And they did so, especially in state government, to basically ensure that Republicans would win and have control 
of both of those houses of our state legislature for quite some time. They locked it in. As you put it then, Professor Whitford, the legislature, the, the legislators chose their voters. Their voters did not choose their elected representatives. How did you view the maps at that time, Professor Whitford, and why did you get involved in this case? Well, I, I should say I'm not only a retired law professor, but I'm a longtime political junkie, and uh, and I'm a longtime partisan Democrat. So from the partisan Democrat side, they were a total disaster. Uh, and, and the they here being the redrawn legislative district maps that's following right. the 2010 census. As was demonstrated very clearly in the 2012 elections where the Democrats won the statewide vote, uh, but the Republicans got close to a two-thirds majority in each Yeah, uh, just the, the exact statistics there from the 2012 election was that despite receiving less than 58%, excuse me, less than 50% of the vote, Republicans in these statewide races, especially for state assembly, received just shy of 49% of the vote, in the state assembly, they controlled nearly 61% of the assembly seats. Mm -hmm. That ain't one person, one vote, is it, Bill? No, and it was, uh, and there was no reason to expect any change. And so the question became uh, what, to, what to do about it. Uh, a very good friend of mine uh, who just passed, uh, Fred Kessler from Milwaukee, and also a redistricting expert in the, it was sitting in the state legislature at the time, uh, asked me to join a group of other lawyers and partisans. Uh, they were discussing that exactly uh, on a weekly, bi-weekly basis in the Watts Tea Room in Milwaukee. Now, now a jewelry shop. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we concluded that there was a possible U.S. constitutional claim uh, based on uh, examining the previous precedents, and, and I won't go into the detail of it, but it was our judgment that Wisconsin had a fact situation that might just persuade Justice Anthony Kennedy. Uh, Who was the swing vote at the would time? Would have been the swing vote. Yes. Uh, that the U.S. Constitution should put some limits on what I'll call the degree of partisan gerrymandering. And before this, the Supreme Court had indicated that maybe a gerrymander can be so partisan that it is unconstitutional. They had basically allowed partisan gerrymandering to an extent, yeah. which was, I, would I be wrong in saying this, Bill, that the, the degree to which the Supreme Court in the past, prior to your case, and we'll talk about how they've never really solved this problem and won't, that the Supreme Court of the past had basically said, well, we expect there to be a partisan gerrymander to an extent because in most states they didn't have independent redistricting committees. Um, but that there's some hypothetical fact pattern out there where it'll just be too ridiculous. Well, they hadn't quite held that that there could be a fact pattern too ridiculous to pass constitutional muster. But they'd refuse to say that there wasn't a fact <laughs> pattern. They'd been ambivalent about it. Ruling and, in the uh, negative, I see, yes. And, and Kennedy had written in those earlier opinions, and based on that, we had some reason to believe that we had the fact situation that might... Um, might be get, that pattern, ...get yes. his vote. So then the next problem became, uh, and we didn't see any other avenue for change in the decade. You know, the Republicans had 60 to 65 percent majorities. At that time, Scott Walker was governor. But in any event, you weren't going to change the redistricting without having the legislature involved. Uh, you weren't going to change it politically, and of course they wouldn't. Um, so the only avenue was this kind of litigation approach, and... Uh, we decided to try to bring the case and test. It would have been a set of new US, U.S. Supreme Court precedent. That's not a small endeavor to be, bring a case that has to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. No, and it takes a long time and, to boot. And, <laughs> yes, and, and even then probably win five to four at best. At um, best, yep. So the next question became who were going to be the lawyers who were going to put together the case. And that that's no small endeavor. It's not just finding some guy in 
down the street who will volunteer his time. We didn't have any money. Yeah, before we uh, got on air, Professor, you and I were talking a bit about this, and to so as to not bury the lead here, um, though it may seem hard for people to believe, it is challenging to find expert lawyers who will take on cases like this that are willing to go the long mile all the way to the Supreme Court. You got to get expert witnesses. They cost a fortune. It's an expensive endeavor, and it actually can be quite challenging to find highly skilled counsel that are able to bring this kind of case and or who will willing. do willing to do it for next to nothing, given that there's all these expenses. As That's well. right. So I won't take the time to tell you how we lucked into a kind of hodgepodge ad hoc group of lawyers to bring the case, but we were lucky and the case got filed. So when we come back, we're going to dig into what exactly the claims that you made, why they're important. Um, but let's just set it up again. I'm talking to professor Bill Whitford, longtime law professor at the university of Wisconsin law school by Bill's uh, own recounting a partisan Democrat. I appreciate the transparency there and a political junkie. Junkie, what is gerrymandering, Bill? Let's just start with that baseline. Well, gerrymandering, we could go into the history of the term, but basically uh, it is it refers to a kind of manipulation of legislative district lines. Uh, in the United States, we have a long-time tradition uh, of having single-member districts, with those districts defined geographically and needing to be, we say, contiguous, that is to say, connected. Uh, it is possible to draw those lines uh, in a way that will lead a res to results that are totally disproportionate to the political views of the political entity here at state. Uh, in other words, uh, be undemocratic over or under representation of a particular political party, given the overall political polling or voting patterns of that jurisdiction. That's right. Effectively cheating, picking your voters instead of voters well, picking their legislators because yeah. of the way the lines are drawn. Yeah. We're going to take care of a little bit of business here, Bill. We're going to come back with University of Law School professor Bill Whitford. We're talking about the groundbreaking gerrymandering case from Wisconsin that made it all the way to the Supreme Court. You may be wondering, well, what the heck happened after that? Why have I heard more about this? We'll discuss that and so much more. Don't go anywhere. I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to The Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Join us. You got questions for Bill or I, 855-75-CIVIC. That's 855-752-4842. Keep it locked. I'm telling these tears go and fall away, fall away. Oh, may the last one burn into flame. You're listening to Civic Media. You can tune into any of our live shows on any radio station across the state with the Civic Media app. Find us in your phone's app store and listen anytime, anywhere. I'm Maggie Dawn. You're listening to the Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. It's deer season, y'all. I know you've been eagerly awaiting it, um, including the wives who get to kick their husbands out for for, for a goodly number of days and, and have the run of the roost, as, as the old sayings would go, the deer hunting widows. But here on Civic Media, we've got you covered. If you are one of those deer hunters, man or woman, husband or wife, and you want to talk hunting with your fellow hunters, going on his 25th year of hosting this show, Joel, Joel Karnak is going to lead our nightly two-hour wooded drive with precision and expertise. It is the Deer Hunters Roundup. You can find it each night during the hunt from 6 to 8 p.m., except for the Sunday Packer game, of course, and on Thanksgiving Day. You can find this across the network on WCQM, WHSM, WIRI, and, of course, on the Civic Media app. So pop open a cold one, 
Take a bite of your jerky stick and settle in for the craziest and most unpredictable radio experience that the backwoods can offer. Check it out. Again, that's the Deer Hunters Roundup starting last week and ending on December 1st all across the Civic Media Radio Network. Check it out on your Civic Media app. I know I will be taking a listen myself. Maybe to just get myself schooled on hunting vernacular. I'm woefully undereducated in that regard. But here to keep you up to date on where gerrymandering sits here in the state of Wisconsin is my very special guest, UW Law Professor Emeritus, Bill Woodford. He taught me contracts uh, back in the day, and now he's here to help us understand gerrymandering better. So, Bill, right before the break, we were talking about the idea that in gerrymandering, Um, There is strategic drawing of legislative district lines that effectively um, lead to a result where it's where where it's not one person, one vote, that the overall uh, political leanings of here in in this case, the state of Wisconsin aren't reflected in the election outcomes for state Senate and assembly. And we were talking about the fact that they do this through two techniques, cracking and packing. Yes. Let's start with cracking. What's cracking? Well, uh, I want to start with both concepts because the goal yeah. here is to waste votes uh, of the the party that's going to be the minority in the legislature, the disadvantaged party here, the Democrats. Uh, and be sure that you waste more votes of Democrats than you waste Republican votes. And that's done through cracking and packing. Cracking means spreading a lot of Democrats in all districts that are going to be won by predictably won by Republicans, so the there's approximately forty percent Democrats or thirty five forty percent. That ensures that the Democrats can never win the district, and but all those votes are in a sense wasted. They don't count in electing a representative. Packing is another technique for wasting votes. You take districts that are safely Democratic and you throw all the Democrats in there that you possibly can. The districts might be 80, 90 percent Democratic. Well, you only need 51 percent to win the district. So all those Democrats in excess of 51 percent, all those votes are essentially wasted. They don't help elect a Democrat into the legislature. So cracking is a way of diluting the voting power of voters that are more likely to vote for Democrats. And that's what happened back in 2010, 2011, 2012, as the Republican legislature was drawing the maps. And packing is to effectively over-represent votes within a certain district. Yeah, it dilutes the Democratic votes because it takes them out of all those districts that are about 40% Democrat that you throw a few more Democrats in and suddenly they could perhaps win that district. So you take them out and you put them in a district that Democrats are going to win anyhow. That's packing. So, again, Republicans did this to fabulous effect if you're a Republican it was, after the 2010 census. It was the most technically competent gerrymander. In the uh, history of the country. Uh, well, yeah, pr- pretty close anyhow. It is, I don't know of a better one. It yes. was technically very proficient. Very proficient. So what was the core claim that you and your fellow plaintiffs made to challenge the cracking and packing and the dilution of Democratic votes that was executed by the GOP-controlled state government? Well, we sought to get a a constitutional judgment by the Supreme Court that the U.S. Constitution put boundaries on the degree of partisan gerrymandering of single-member legislative districts in the name of one man, one vote kind of thinking, in the name of the thinking that where democracy in the United States means the majority should rule. We have minority rights that are constitutionally protected, but the majority should rule subject to those minority rights. Yeah. In other words, the majority on average over time, you would expect to see able to elect their preferred uh, legislative leaders And what we saw in the state of Wisconsin following the redistricting in 2010 was that while the state overall preferred Democrats and the series of elections during that decade proved that up, Republicans had near veto proof majorities, super majorities 
in both state houses of the legislature, that being the Senate and the Assembly. Yes, and I'd, I'd say the consequence of a partisan gerrymander is extreme in Wisconsin. It's not just guaranteeing an unrepresentative legislature, but it also discourages partisan energy and partisan activity on the disadvantaged party. And so it becomes much harder for the Democrats to recruit an outstanding candidate for the state assembly one, because they're not likely to win. Two, even if they do win, they're just a minority in the assembly. And, you know, it's not, it's kind of a thankless job to be a minority member in a legislative body that's two thirds the other party. I heard these conversations myself personally when I was with Democratic Party operatives. We can't get anybody to run in blank, blank, blank district because they know they're going to lose. And even if they can squeak one out, they have no power in state government. Who that's wants exactly, the job? That's a consequence of partisan gerrymandering. We're going to take care of some more business. Come back with UW Law School professor, gerrymandering expert Bill Whitford. We're going to dig into the consequences of that Supreme Court decision or indecision, if you want to put it that way. When we come back right here on the Maggie Dawn Show on the Civic Media Radio Network. Keep it locked. You're an organ donor, right? Well, here's a tragic fact. Approximately 20 people die each day waiting for precious donated organs. You could make a life-saving decision simply by getting that important dot on your driver's license. That little dot shows those who need to know that you've made a decision to donate organs at a critical time. Go to HeroicDeed.com to learn more about the importance of organ donation and how you can make your wishes known. Talk to your family. Get the dot. Save lives. HeroicDeed.com Welcome if you're just joining us. My name is Maggie Dawn, and you're listening to The Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. From local news to what is going on around the state of Wisconsin, Civic Media's mission is to bring you real news and great conversation every single day. I'm having a great conversation this afternoon with UW Law Professor Bill Whitford. If you want to join the conversation with Bill and I, you've got questions about gerrymandering. Where do things stand now? What is the law in all of this? We're going to answer each of those, but if you've got questions, Bill and I will help to answer them. 855-75-CIVIC, 855-752-4842. Comments, welcome as well. So, Bill, we, we are talking about the packing and the cracking, the fact that the 20, the maps that came out of the 2010 census here in the state of Wisconsin were potentially the most partisan maps that we have ever seen in the United States, and that it basically diluted or wasted votes of Democrats so that Republicans retained control over state government for many, many years, despite the fact that the majority of Wisconsinites were actually voting for Democrats in their assembly and Senate uh, uh, races. So you all brought a lawsuit. You raised equal protection claims under the 14th Amendment. It got all the way up to the Supreme Court. And then what happened? Did the, did the yeah. Supreme Court... Give us some guidance on no. how partisan is too partisan? No, I should mention that we won in the lower court, which is called the district court. And yes. It was the first time any federal court had declared a state apportionment unconstitutional as excessively partisan. Uh, in the Supreme Court, uh, the argument was uh, October 27th. They didn't decide it until June 2018. And at that point... They basically sent the case back to the district court on a technicality for more proceedings, which happened. But while those proceedings were going on, 
Another case that raised a similar claim out of North Carolina was decided by the Supreme Court. At that time, Justice Kennedy had retired and he'd been replaced by Brett Kavanaugh. So our key swing vote wasn't there. And the Supreme Court decided five to four that basically the federal constitution sets no boundaries on the degree of partisanship in legislative apportionment, no regulation of gerrymandering under the U.S. Constitution. So just to summarize, and correct me if I get any of this wrong, Bill, you have here in the state of Wisconsin, dating from the 2010 census, we had a federal case that finally was filed in 2016. It was heard. It eventually went up to the Supreme Court. And the question before the court was, can you have such an extreme partisan gerrymander with with outcomes where less than half of the people are voting for Republicans and yet 60 plus percent of the seats are going to Republicans where we have absolutely trashed the principle of one person, one vote, finally gets all the way to the Supreme Court and they go, eh, you know, technicality, go back down to court. And then the next case they hear on a similar set of issues, they say the federal constitution says nothing about this. Am I getting that basically right? That's right. Well, where the heck did that leave Wisconsinites? Well, Well, we had no option. As I mentioned, we brought the case because there was no political option for getting rid of the gerrymander. We're now in 2018. Uh, The Democrats were able to win the governorship, uh, but you couldn't change the legislative representation without an act of the legislature. Which they weren't going to do. So basically there was nothing to do. And... uh, Electing Governor Tony Evers was important because he could veto stuff. Yes. But he couldn't change the apportionment. Uh, what happened next is the 2020 census under those principles we haven't discussed. But uh, after each census, each state is required to reapportion, redraw uh, their maps to be sure that the populations of each district are more or less the same. And Evers was able to veto. Uh, the next version of the Republican gerrymander, which was enacted by the legislature. And that sent it to the state Supreme Court to decide what the maps would be during the current decade. State Supreme Court was then controlled famously by four conservatives. And they basically put in place the, the Republican legislative maps that Evers had vetoed. In a sense, they negated the governor's veto power. So we continued with an apportionment, uh, a partisan apportionment, a little bit different, but not a lot, uh, through the 2022 elections. So we've now got (laughs) better-ish maps. We just went through an election cycle. I think a couple of things that jump out to me are these. One is when you see... Well, we should this... talk about how we got them. Can yes. I do that? Yes, please, Bill. Go ahead. So what happened after 2022 is there was a change in the state Supreme Court. There's nothing in the U.S. Constitution decision that prevented a state Supreme Court from right. putting boundaries on the degree of partisanship. And uh, the, my, my people, my group, I shouldn't call them my people, <laughs> held back suing in the state Supreme Court as long as there was, it was that 4-3 Republican majority, majority or conservative majority up there. But then there was the key state Supreme Court election in 2023 that elected Justice Protasiewicz and established a four-person progressive majority up there. And so we filed that state court case immediately. Uh, I wasn't the named plaintiff in the next case, but it went up to state Supreme Court and they decided 4-3 to throw out the maps. They did so not on the grounds that the state constitution establishes constitutional boundaries on the degree of partisanship, but on a technicality. But that threw out the map, and they insisted that a new map be fair. And that's the map that the 24 elections... And that the governor ultimately signed. And that's what we ran this last cycle that's with right. those maps. Just, just as a refresher... Before the 2020 census, still under the old maps, again, which came from the 2010 census, in 2018, the state assembly races saw 54% of the votes cast in the state of Wisconsin got cast for Democratic assembly candidates. 
And yet, Republicans maintained their 63 seat, almost veto proof supermajority. And it w- hasn't been until this last election cycle. So, in 2024, is how long it's taken us after 2010 to get to fairer maps. Now, with these maps in place, Bill, how do you view the outcome of this last election? Well, of course, I was disappointed in the presidential result, but uh, it wasn't a disaster for Democrats in Wisconsin. Um, the new maps pr- provide for a, a great number of contestable state legislative seats, ones that either party could win. Uh, in the state Senate, the Democrats, there were five such seats out of the 16 races in the state Senate. Democrats won all five, and the result was a four-seat pickup in the state legislature. The, the margin in the state Senate is only half the seats were up, so there was no possibility to get a Democratic majority, but the margin's down to 1815, and if Democrats can pick up two more seats in 2026 when the other half of the state Senate seats are up, they'll have a majority. In the Assembly, it wasn't as successful. The contestable seats, there were 10 to 12 of them, were split more or less 50-50, and the Democrats picked up 10 seats in the state assembly, but ended up with 45, where it requires 50 for a majority. So we're five seats short. This this gets me to what I think is the, the two most important questions. And the first question is, why should every single voter, no matter what party you may more frequently align with, why should every single voter want less partisan gerrymandering or or to have more of an independent redistricting committee approach. Why is this bad, highly partisan gerrymandering? Why is that bad for every voter? Well, it creates non-majoritarian government or unrepresentative government, as you said. And I I say the the state Supreme Court did not establish a precedent that were boundaries on a degree of partisan gerrymandering. Any in 2030, there's going to be another census. A census in 2031, there's going to be another reapportionment. If the Republicans control everything as they did in 2011, they'll do another partisan gerrymander. And and the, the case, same could be true if it was all Democrats. That's right. So you know, big picture, very big picture, a constitutional mistake made really from the founding of the republic was to leave the question of how to draw district lines to very interested parties in the state legislature. It should be taken away from the state legislature to people who will act in a more more, neutral, more principled, less self-interested way. It's the ultimate conflict of interest to draw the legislative boundary lines that you yourself will then run under. Why wouldn't someone all else being equal, give themselves an advantage, make it easier to win. But the result as we've been saying, Bill, for every voter is more extreme government. And we know every time we ask voters, do you want to see more working across the aisle? You want to see more cooperation, more bipartisanship voters say, yes, I want Want more of that, and yet the extreme partisan gerrymander, which mm. neither the, the the U.S. Supreme Court has said they can't weigh in on, and the, our state Supreme Court has failed to weigh in on, works to exactly the opposite effect. It makes less accountable elected officials for both Republicans and Democrats. And, and it's very consequential. As you may know, there's been a book written about this last decade or so in Wisconsin called The Fall in Wisconsin by Dan Kaufman, a Madison guy, by the way. Uh, And it's all about how under Walker and this Republican legislature, they undercut all Wisconsin's or most of many of Wisconsin's progressive traditions. Well, and even my argument is really much fundamentally very basic, and that is When you partisan gerrymander at this level, the democratically drawn districts are far more left and the Republican drawn districts are far more right. That's right. The only election that matters is the primary. The only election that matters is the primary. And that's for all of us. We keep saying we want our elected officials to work together to get stuff done that works for the great majority of us. And we're setting up a system that a constitutional mistake, as you put it, Bill, that, that simply 
uh, metastasizes and repeats this pattern over and over again. Um, I'm going to ask when we come back, we're going to take care of a little bit of business here, but let's get into this question just a bit and then we'll continue to talk about it. Are we still vulnerable? We've talked about the fact that the federal Supreme Court won't do anything. The state Supreme Court has yet to do anything. Are we still vulnerable to this extreme? this extremist political outcomes through this gerrymander after the 2030 census. What do you think, Bill? Are we still vulnerable? Oh, we are definitely vulnerable. That, you know, we can hope in the 2030 election, the Democrats either win the governorship or a majority in one of the houses. That'll be enough to prevent what's called a trifecta, which is yes. what produces the partisan gerrymander. And, and, and it's not, again, to anyone's best interest, even for the ruby red. If you're a Republican or someone who leans on the conservative edge, you still want a responsive elected official who feels that they need to address your concerns when you give them a call. If they know gosh darn well, they don't really need to worry about any competition. It makes, even if you're a Republican, your elected res representatives less likely to care about what you need. And, and we should hope that a lot of the citizens out there believe, in, 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 regardless of their partisan inclination, in, uh, inclinations, in the idea of majority government. Isn't that what we were all taught what the American Revolution was about? Uh, that our systems, our election process should not only work, but that the outcomes should produce a representative government. That's right. Mm, who... What a novel concept, it seems, and yet it was that was the original intent of the Founding Fathers and Read the Read the Declaration of yes. Independence. Yes, one person, one vote. When we come back, I'm going to talk more with UW Law Professor about what does this all mean today? How confident is Bill in the rule of law in the country? What does he expect from the next Trump administration? We'll talk about all of that. Take some of your comments and thoughts when we come back right here on the Maggie Dawn Show on the Civic Media Radio Network, 855-75-CIVIC. That's 855-752-4842. Back in just a moment. You're listening to Civic Media. Find the latest news, information, and archives of all your favorite shows on the Civic Media website, civicmedia.us. Happy Monday, everybody. My name is Maggie Dawn. You're listening to The Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. We've been talking gen uh, gerrymandering with Professor Bill Whitford of the University of Wisconsin Law School. He was one of the named plaintiffs in the gerrymandering lawsuit that came out of the 2010 census redrawn maps here in the state of Wisconsin that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, only to have the Supreme Court not reach the issue and later decide in a subsequent case that they can never decide that there is no federal constitutional remedy for a partisan gerrymander that's just too partisan. Some great questions coming across on YouTube. Chad has been asking us on YouTube, so you like the new maps or you don't like the new maps? What's the problem here? And I, I want to ask you that question, Professor Whitford, but I'm going to take a crack at it too and then let Bill give you his two cents. I do not like the way that legislative districting, redistricting is done in the state of Wisconsin, period. I don't care who's in control. Partisan gerrymandering is not good for voters, whether Democrats are doing it or Republicans are doing it. I think we need a different system, a system that does not allow the people who stand to benefit from the drawing of the district lines to draw the district lines. It's a complete conflict of interest. What are the solutions that I would propose or like to see? Things like independent redistricting committees that don't permit politicians to be on them, right? To have actual election experts, people who are politically neutral or at least have a political balance, draw those maps, not the people who are about to have to run under those maps. That doesn't make any sense. Here's some other things. We could consider 
in addition to having uh, an independent redistricting committee, we could hope that our state Supreme Court actually defines what are the factors that would indicate that a gerrymander is far too partisan and has therefore violated the state constitution. We could look at moving away from single member legislative districts so that you could have either multi-member districts or just statewide proportional representation. What I'd like are election outcomes that fairly reflect the overall viewpoints of Wisconsinites. That's what I want. Again, I don't care if partisan gerrymandering is being done by Democrats or Republicans. I don't think it's a good way to draw legislative districts. Bill, your thoughts. What is the state of play? What should our objectives well, be? To go to Chad's question, uh, obviously the maps now are pretty fair, and they were technically enacted by the legislature and signed by Evers, but they were legislatively produced, in other words, but under a threat by the U.S. by the Wisconsin Supreme Court that they would only accept fair maps, and so the legislature decided to propose these maps rather than wait for the court to draft its own maps. Uh, I don't expect the legislature would have enacted these maps except under that kind of pressure from the state Supreme Court. And absent the Supreme Court's involvement, which was this time on a kind of technicality, uh, I, I expect the Republican legislature to enact another partisan gerrymander. And again, I don't think that helps Republican citizens who want responsive government. I don't think it helps Democratic-leaning citizens who also want responsive government. Let's step back here at the 100,000-foot level, Bill. We got a second Trump administration coming up. What do you anticipate um, from that administration at a really high level? What concerns do you have? And where do you think sort of the rule of law stands right now in the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, I have so many concerns. Uh, we could go on well into the evening, but uh, <laughs> sticking to the rule of law that kind of prompt, uh, you know, Trump has uh, exhibited or stated various authority, authoritarian Leanings has talked about he's going to be a dictator for a day and stuff like that. To me, the phrase rule of law, which everybody says is good, it's like saying you're for democracy or yes. so forth. <laughs> uh, the, the rule of law, the basic idea behind it is that all governmental decisions should be accountable to some other body as not too inconsistent with some kind of principle. Uh, what the objection is to having uh, no accountability in decision making. Elections are, of course, a big source of accountability. Uh, but elections don't work very well in a in a gerrymandered environment. And uh, the other big source of accountability in the American system are the courts, which interpret the U.S. Constitution, are considered to have final authority. But the courts have become widely perceived to be, and I think fairly, much more partisan than they were previously, and hence less proficient at providing that accountability. So on the rule of law, that's my concern. We're hearing a little bit of, We're hearing a little echo. Bit of echo. Working on so I'm going right to keep now. on going. So I'm going to keep on going. Folks, you have been hearing from Bill Whitford, University of Wisconsin Law School professor, self-proclaimed partisan. We've been talking about the gerrymander maps. And, and Bill, I just want to lift up a point points that you just made. I asked Bill, what, what are your great concerns about the next Trump administration? And as that relates to the rule of law, he pointed out what I think every single American, every Wisconsinite wants, and that is elected officials that are accountable. are accountable. And one key, and source, one of key source of that accountability is, of, is course, of course, the courts the themselves. Courts themselves. To the extent that, the we've, extent all that we've all lost faith, faith in, our court, system, in our court system, that weakens our ability to hold elected officials accountable. And certainly at the end of the day, the thing that I am very concerned about that sort of is the outgrowth of what you just laid out, Bill, is that corruption becomes much more likely as accountability goes down. And I don't care if it's a Republican that's corrupt or a Democrat that's corrupt. Corruption in our government uh, is, a, is a government that's failing to serve the needs of all of us. Bill, thanks so much for your time. It was a real pleasure to see you, sir. 
I hope we can do this again sometime. Well, be nice, Maggie. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. We're going to come right back after your uh, news, weather, and sports. I've got a great guest. Her name is Andrea Dukas. We're going to talk about the impact of RFK's appointment as DHHS director. The national news cycle never stops, but it can be hard to find news about your local community. Civic Media is dedicated to providing quality local and state news coverage across Wisconsin. With the Civic Media app, you can get notifications about local stories that matter to you and your community. Find the free Civic Media app in your phone's app store and choose notifications from the menu to tell us what kind of news you want to hear about. 